So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton World for Everybody Worldwide. We're very happy to have two giants in our field today with us, Larry Summers from Harvard and Paul Grubman, a former colleague of mine here at Princeton and now at SUNY and well known also for his uh, uh, writings in the New York Times. We will talk today about uh, will the Biden stimulus lead to inflation? So we have a debate today. It's a new format. We're very excited about that. And we will start with no further ado. Larry will uh, start his remarks and then Paul will have a response to it. And then we go back and forth and have a Q&A session uh, back and forth. So Larry, of course, everybody knows Larry, former Treasury Secretary and also Chief Economist of the World Bank and um, head of the NEC at the White House. So he had many, many important policy roles and uh, knows both the economics and the policy side. And we're very glad to have Larry and Paul with us, the two giants in our field. Thanks again for both of you. And uh, Larry, the floor is yours. Marcus, thank you. And thank you for the terrific public good you have provided uh, through uh, the Marcus uh, Academy. I'm glad to be here for this uh, discussion. Let's, let me be clear at the outset what I think we're uh, discussing. Uh, some of this, I suspect, was set off by my Washington Post column about uh, 10 days ago. I don't, as an economist out of government, have views as to what the right political strategies uh, are. And certainly, I've got enormous respect for President uh, Biden and the very, very serious and able people who comprise uh, his economic uh, team. And I think it is clear that uh, it is urgently important to provide relief so that we do not have a K-shaped uh, recovery. It is urgently important that we support aggregate demand through uh, the period uh, ahead. That the lesson of the last uh, years is the importance of using fiscal policy aggressively. Indeed, that's been a central aspect of my secular stagnation uh, thesis, that at a moment like this, it's better to err on the side of doing too much than to err on the side of uh, doing uh, too little. These though are qualitative arguments, very compelling, qualitative arguments that could be used in support of a $1 trillion program or in support of a $5 trillion program and could be used in support of programs with a variety of different uh, compositions. I find myself rather surprisingly at this moment, a bit like a long-term advocate of the minimum wage who and increases in the minimum wage, who discovers that the federal government is now proposing to raise the middle minimum wage to $23 for a year or two. Um, on the one hand, approving of the broad impulse. On the other hand, very much wondering about uh, the design and timing of the proposed uh, policy measures. Let me make uh, four points that encapsulate uh, my concerns. First, what is contemplated is extremely large. I don't think there's any question that in retrospect, it would have been better if fiscal stimulus had been larger in uh, 2009. The Obama administration basically had that view and wasn't able ask questions about the tactics to legislate that through the Congress as it uh, stood at that time. But I think what's important to recognize is that as the first slide uh, illustrates, uh, the proposed stimulus uh, here is far larger relative to uh, the gap Previous, uh, previous one, Marcus, is far larger 
relative uh, to uh, the gap than anything that was undertaken in 2009. Yes, 2009 was too small. Was it too small by a factor of five? That's not an argument I've heard uh, previously. Similarly, the proposed stimulus is much larger than the stimulus or support program that was contemplated in uh, 2020. So at 14% of uh, GDP in uh, new measures, a cumulative budget deficit approaching 20% of uh, GDP, we are in uh, extraordinary uh, territory. Second observation, this goes way beyond what is necessary to meet the absolute imperative of uh, relief. There is no question that there is tremendous suffering because of COVID's direct and indirect consequences. And it is government's obligation to meet uh, that uh, need. But if you remember only one number that I say, remember this one. Income, wages and salary, total income is running about $25 billion a month below an optimistic projection of where it would have been without COVID, $25 billion. In contrast, if you look at the unemployment insurance plus the checks plus the child credits, plus the rental assistance, which is small. You spread that out over the whole year, you are getting a number that is in excess of $100 billion a month. That's why it's projected that disposable income for households will be well above traditionally projected levels. Of course, it's probably more important to look at the lower income populations, but because the assistance is targeted towards the lower income populations, as the next slide uh, illustrates, the magnitude of the assistance relative to uh, lost income is much um, greater than it is uh, for the population at a whole. This should not be surprising. Unemployment insurance is going to provide greater incomes than employment did for nearly two thirds of uh, those who are unemployed. And whereas unemployment insurance normally reaches half the populate, half the unemployed, now the number of unemployment insurance recipients is slightly in excess of uh, the number of people who are unemployed. Similarly, Jason Furman and others have calculated that if you look at state revenue uh, shortfalls, they are dwarfed by the combination of the assistance in December and the assistance proposed uh, now. Um, and so we are doing far more than is necessary to meet our obligation of addressing uh, the victims um, of COVID. Is this wise? There are, I think, two reasons for believing that we could be passing much better legislation that would do more for our economic future. The third point uh, I would make is the point that Olivier Blanchard uh, has made and that has been implicit in questions that have been raised about the Fed's uh, current approach. We risk a inflationary collision of some kind. Paul very perceptively writing in November 
predicted a Biden boom, reminiscent of Morning in America, at a time when it was in doubt whether there'd be a lame duck stimulus. And before the Georgia outcome, it was inconceivable that anything like the front loaded $1.9 trillion program would be put forward. He was right, given the expansionary financial conditions, given the likelihood that uh, we will, by the midsummer, put COVID in uh, the rear mirror, given a very competitive uh, dollar. To take a potentially booming economy and to put on top of it $1.9 trillion of stimulus is to take real chances of a kind that I don't believe we need uh, to take. The historically remembered LBJ guns and butter collision involved excesses on the order of one to 2% of uh, GDP. We don't know enough about uh, the Phillips curve. We don't have enough experience to make uh, confident uh, forecasts. But when we are speaking of fiscal actions of this potential magnitude on top of an economy that quite likely would be booming with uh, no further uh, fiscal stimulus, we are, I believe, taking uh, imprudent risks. The prospect has been held out that the Fed can manage any problems that arise. That is not my reading of the historical experience. My reading of the historical experience is that almost every time the inflation has accelerated and the Fed has felt it necessary to step in to prevent uh, inflation from accelerating, the result has been uh, that the economy has gone into recession. The Fed has had essentially no success in engineering soft landings. Every time unemployment has risen by half a percent, it has risen uh, by uh, two uh, percent. And so the risks are very substantial of collision. Those risks might be, run, might be worth running if that was necessary in order to provide relief, but it isn't. They might be worth uh, running if this was all that was at stake. But, and this brings me to my final point, the centerpiece of the president's campaign, rightly, was a program of building back better through large scale public investment in preventing climate change, in infrastructure, in education, in uh, the caring economy. And what's contemplated is trillions of dollars of further investment on top of a situation that is potentially problematic in terms of uh, its aggregate demand uh, impact. What should happen uh, instead? There's nothing wrong with a $1.9 trillion target or even a larger target, but the emphasis should be on public investment and building back better, preparing us to protect the climate, preparing us to compete with uh, China, preparing us to be a more just society. As many economists have advocated, there's an important role for triggers. I could be wrong. It could turn out that COVID is much longer lasting and now looks likely. We've seen that Congress can be dysfunctional. Triggers that would increase unemployment insurance if that were to happen or in extremis would provide benefits to households. 
um, would uh, be um, appropriate. So but a to... much better program, I'm just stopping, a much better program would be a program that was focused on meeting necessary relief needs in a targeted and efficient way, focused on public uh, investment with contingency triggers if the economy were uh, to turn down. That would be a better basis for durable prosperity. Thanks a lot, uh, Larry. You, you made a very strong point that the size essentially, if it was spread over the years and it were more investment focused, I guess, it would be different in terms of inflation expectations. Paul had recently revived his blog and had a very nice uh, first entry in his uh, new blog. And uh, so we're very glad to have him back in the blogosphere. And uh, I'm sure that Paul has his own perspective and I'm curious to find out, we all are curious to find out what his uh, perspective is on this Biden stimulus. Okay. Um... I found myself remembering some physics history as getting ready for this uh, discussion. Um, uh, a very young Wolfgang Pauli, after hearing a presentation by Albert Einstein, said, uh, what Professor Einstein has to say is not entirely stupid. Uh, so what Larry had to say is not entirely, no, I mean, it's, 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 I, I think there's a, there's a very serious point, uh, which is that we should indeed be thinking about the macroeconomics of this big program. Uh, but I have a quite different take, and I think it's, it is uh, not to say that Larry's concerns are entirely off base, but I think that, that they're not, they're exaggerated, and you do need to think about what are the actual alternatives here. So um, I think the first thing to say, which I've been trying to say since the very early stages, but just doesn't seem to get through, is that this is, this is not about stimulus. Uh, we are not in a conventional recession. Uh, it is something, if you, it's a combination of supply and demand shock, but I don't think it really helps it. We're, we're still essentially in a, in a partial lockdown, uh, which is in part, uh, uh, part with the result of government policies, bans on full scale indoor dining and so on, but largely also just voluntary. Uh, who's going to be dumb enough to, uh, some people will, but you shouldn't, even if it's allowed, you shouldn't be going to full indoor restaurants. And uh, this means that we have a situation of suppressed output, um, it, which is not uh, well described by the concept of an output gap. It is not the case that we, if we had sufficient aggregate demand, we would be back up to some estimate of potential output. We are rightly not doing a lot of stuff we would normally be doing. Um, which means that the whole framework of stimulus to fill an output gap is not the right way to think about where we are. Um, I've suggested that we think about it as disaster relief, uh, or in some ways, it's like it's like fighting a war. Um, and uh, you know, when when Pearl Harbor gets attacked, you don't say how big is the output gap. Let's size the defense budget based on plausible multipliers to fill that output gap. That's not, that's not what you do. You, you spend enough to actually win the struggle that you're in, um, which doesn't mean, although it's not stimulus, uh, it can nonetheless be stimulative. So there is a, a, you do want to think about the, the macroeconomics of it, but you do want to do that you know, with the understanding that that's not the purpose of what you're doing. Um, and for what it's worth, if you think of this as being a temporary emergency that requires a bunch of spending, which I think we all do, uh, question, how should that spending be paid for? Well, this is pure standard public finance theory, which says that uh, if you have a temporary need for a bunch of spending, you don't want to raise taxes to fully pay for it. You, you want to spread it out over time. So uh, a largely deficit financed response is appropriate. Um, before I get into the size issue, I think it's helpful to think about you know, where does this come from? How does the spending get to be so big relative to uh, the output shortfall. And we can, I, I don't think, um, it's fair, I don't think output gap is an appropriate framework in any case. And the size of the output shortfall relative to what you might have expected is very contingent upon what you, uh, where you thought we were in 2019. And I'm not, I'm not of the view that we were actually uh, above potential output then. So there are some issues there, but it's clearly by any reasonable calculation, 
we're talking about a spending package that is at least twice and probably more than that, the size of the shortfall in, in nominal GDP that uh, relative to what we should have expected. So what's in there? Three components. I, I, I'd say conceptually, you wanna think about three components. First, there's public good spending related to the pandemic. Shots in arms, making schools safe to reopen quite a several hundred billion dollars of stuff that is really quite clearly directly related to the public health emergency. Uh, it's not most of the package, but it's a significant part of it. Second, there's income support. Um, the um, unemployment insurance being the most important part of that and the income support is, you know, is a, it's a big deal. Um, and to some extent, you want to think of aid to state and local governments as being a kind of income support because of our fiscal federalism and balanced budget requirements, uh, lower levels of government are in some ways in the same position as liquidity constrained unemployed workers. They, they need aid to tide them over. And then the third part, there's a bunch of stuff that is not very targeted. Uh, I've, in my blog post, I called it belt and suspenders. It's uh, the argument for things like the checks to, you know, uh, uh, the, to most adults regardless of economic circumstances, are the, the economic argument for them is that um, any attempt to create criteria for targeted aid is going to have gaps in it. And certainly the unemployment uh, benefit has gaps in it. So you're throwing out a bunch of money, much of it going to people who have not been hurt by the pandemic or not significantly hurt, but some of it also going to people who really have but are not getting aid. And so you're throwing some money at them. And it's, it's, it's not well targeted, uh, but trying to be too careful can be a problem. It would be, I would be very upset if the whole program or most of the program consisted of untargeted checks, but it doesn't, it's, it's something like a quarter of the program. So those are the three things. And if you wanna think about how the program can be so big relative to the income shortfall, you wanna say, well, there's, there's the public good stuff, which is not related at all to the income shortfall. There is the, um, the income support, which is, supposed to be roughly corresponding to the income shortfall. And then there's the sort of the belt and suspenders stuff, which is on top of that. And so it ends up being a, a very big, very big number. Um, question we should ask then is, uh, uh, first question we should ask is how much overheating is all this going to cause? Or how much, how much net, how much stimulus over and above what we sort of need to get through is this going to provide? Uh, the public good stuff is, it's like defense spending in a war, military spending in a war. It's clearly, it's, it's a significant just plus on demand. Necessary as it may be, it is going to be adding to demand. The income support, less so, because to a large extent, maybe not perfectly, but to a large extent is replacing income loss because of the pandemic. And in fact, if you want to ask what happened last year, it's, it seemed pretty clear that the economy wanted to have a secondary Keynesian recession on top of the pandemic slowdown because there was big loss of income and spillover to demand. And that was short circuited by the CARES Act, which provided aid and, and meant supported incomes and that it, it supported us. And it, it's, uh, it, it really did. It, it wasn't stimulus in the normal sense, but it did in fact provide a floor under, under aggregate demand, which was really important. Um, and, but so I, but again, I don't think that, that I, I'm sorry, not again, the, the public good spending definitely is expansionary. The income support I think is largely just keeping us in place. The broad based stuff, which is the checks, but also I agree, it does kind of look as if we're the, uh, the state and local aid in particular is bigger than the fiscal problems of state and local governments. Um, and uh, certainly in aggregate, um, the, those things are definitely kind of, there's a lot of money. However, it's probably not very stimulative. In fact, it's, it's doing a lot to you know, reassure people as some of it is helping people in need and the rest, I mean, I'm not a big believer in Ricardian equivalents, uh, but if there's anything where you can expect that people will just save a temporary increase in income, um, surely receiving a check that you didn't is not compensating for anything and that you know is a one-time event, a lot of that's gonna be saved. There's a fair bit of evidence that that happened last year. Um, so that the net impact on aggregate demand is not as big. You look at the you know, $1.9 trillion, this is gonna have an aggregate multiplier well under one. 
it's not going to be nearly as big as, as the headline number would suggest. It still is a stimulus on top of an economy. Now, I do think we're going to have a boom, but I don't think it's going to happen until we've got enough vaccination for herd immunity, which means it's going to be coming late in the year. So, it, it, but it, it, I, I'm very optimistic about late 21 into 22, but not right away. Um, the, but we are, and we're putting something on top of that. Um, and I have to say that I think it's a little, yeah, it's true that, that, uh, that monetary policy attempting to offset fiscal stimulus actually, it, you know, has sometimes over, overdone it and, uh, and led to recessions and has sometimes, um, underdone it so that inflation starts to take off. And I, I'm not sure that, that there's any general principle that says that we should presume that, that the Fed is in a systematic way unable to handle this. But it will have to do something if, it's, if things go well, if we do have a kind of booming economy. For what it's worth, which may not be much, the markets aren't acting like they're particularly worried about this, but could be. Um, but I think the other thing that you want to ask is if you don't, um, if you're worried about this, uh, what are you suggesting? Which pieces of the, of the relief package, the rescue plan, I was happy to see the Biden people call it that, not a, not a stimulus. Uh, it, it, which pieces of the rescue plan would you want to drastically cut back? Um, not the public goods pandemic fighting for sure. That's, that's, we, that's what we really need to do. Uh, the unemployment benefits are a bit, you know, they're, they're generous, but it's not as generous as the 600 a week as in, in the CARES Act. And uh, um, it's not that, the, the difference between a, a, what you might think was a reasonable compensation and maybe the slightly higher stuff is not a big deal. Um, generalized checks, yeah, the, you could, uh, the case for those is the weakest of all the pieces, but they're also not likely to have very much stimulative effect. And the same is true for any excess state and local aid state and local governments, if they, if they find themselves getting a lot more money than they're going to need, they're going to large, they're not going to have a huge boom in state spending. We're going to have a lot of it used to replenish rainy day funds. So I don't think that that's a, a, a big inflationary stuff. And the question has got to be, what are you suggesting that we cut? Um, and of course, it, it does matter that the, the checks, which are the least justifiable piece in terms of standard economics are also by far the most popular. And I don't think we can entirely disregard that. That's part of a, uh, a part part of, of of making successful policy is making something that you can actually sell. Thanks. Um, can I just add one last point, sure. Larry? Uh, I agree that the bigger thing is is infrastructure investment, but I don't think that these are competing. Any excess stimulus that we're going to get now is going to be gone by the time any kind of infrastructure program is going to get rolling. Infrastructure stuff is stuff for sometime next year at the earliest. It's just not a, going to be a, a competing issue. And let's, again, let's be realistic. The political economy of this, the constraint on, on the kind of infrastructure plan that Larry and I both want is not financial and it's not macroeconomic, it is political. And it's all about whether we will have a, enough sense that government programs work to be able to do the things we should be doing next year. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul. There was a lot of stuff in it. Let me just summarize. So you think the framework of output gap is probably not sufficient to look at this uh, problem. There's more income support rather than a uh, stimulus. That relates, relates to some resilience argument as well, where the households would like to have more resilience, more of liquidity buffers compared to earlier. We know that in the US, it's for many households that don't have enough liquidity buffers. And perhaps they won't spend it and don't push up the inflation and uh, hold higher liquidity buffers. We don't know. Uh, I was intrigued by your war analogy. The timing is a little bit different now because during the war, uh, you spend during the war when others can't spend so much in private consumption. And when the war is over, I think you have to change. Here, it depends very much how the vaccines are rolled out. But I find it very, so perhaps Larry can respond to it and let's keep it back and forth uh, short. Um, to the questions, the explicit questions you ask, which parts of the stimulus package or the income support package to cut back on? And uh, how do you see the resilience aspects and uh, how would you redesign the whole thing? And perhaps if I throw something to on top of it, you were arguing for secular stagnation, which was an infrastructure 
uh, think the interest rate staying low, perhaps you can combine it with your earlier hypothesis of secular stagnation, where you always argued for more government uh, investments in particular, and um, how, you know, how does this fit being now more conservative? How does it fit with the earlier hypothesis of having expansion because of in, in, uh, secular stagnation? So I'm sympathetic to Paul's basic framework. Uh, there's about $170 billion in there to spend on vaccines and fighting COVID and every penny that we can usefully spend or even half usefully spend fighting COVID, we should spend. I'm for that. Lost labor and salary income is $20 billion a month now going down over the year. Call that $300 billion to be very generous, we should absolutely spend that. That gets us to $500 billion. Uh, there are other categories that you can argue that uh, can be uh, argued about. And so you might get up towards a trillion uh, dollars. I think you have a difficult time getting to 1.9. A uh, trillion dollars were close to 1.9 trillion dollars on Paul's criteria. When he defends the proposition, which he does in a persuasive way, that this may not lead to overheating, the main argument Paul makes is that the spending won't take place this year, but will take place in subsequent years. And so the demand will take place in subsequent years. I think we all mostly expect that we will put COVID in the rearview mirror by the end of 2021, and that we will have a really quite strong economy at the end of 2021. And therefore, if there's more spending on one thing, there'll be less spending on uh, another. And I would rather we run an economy targeted towards public investment in 2021, 2022 and the subsequent years, rather than that we run an economy towards further spend out from people who got money that people in state and local governments who got money that they didn't really need during 2021, but spent it out during 2022 and 2023. I'm focused on keeping room for the public investments that Paul and I um, agree are uh, essential. I don't think it's a very strong argument to say sometimes the Fed was behind the curve and we got inflation, and sometimes the Fed overdid it and we got recession. Therefore, we should assume that the Fed will on average, get it right and be able to keep things under control. I think the way to read that experience is that if we produce a very substantial overheat, the likelihood and the situation around uh, the dollar and the fact that uh, part of the story around GameStop is so-called stimmies from stimulus checks reinforces these concerns. I think the likelihood is that something adverse will happen and therefore it's better not to do that experiment. So it seems to me that much the more prudent approach is to do exactly what Paul says is appropriate, which is to meet the need for this emergency in a generous way through this year while at the same time planning for and providing economic support for things that will create jobs, help those who are disadvantaged, but also build the economy's capacity and create the wherewithal uh, for uh, more uh, debt. So I'd like to see a trillion dollars of public investment built into a two trillion dollar uh, program or a two and a half trillion dollar program uh, to be legislated right now, rather than 
having by far the largest program in American history, whose advocates uh, like Paul recognize that a very substantial part of it is in that third category, that is neither necessary to meet the emergency nor to provide relief uh, for the sufferer. Thanks, Larry. So let me come back to Paul, and I would like to throw some additional element uh, in it, which is uh, politics. And Paul alluded to this already beforehand. How important do you think, Paul, is it that you know the Obama administration, when it came in, we had a huge financial crisis, and the stimulus was too small uh, at that time. And then when the elections came uh, two years later, the Democrats were essentially voted out. And, you know, and then there was still enough money left for a Trump tax cut, which was very generous. Uh, and then we realized the Nairo, the inflation was not popping up. So this experience from uh, the last crisis, to what extent is this shaping now the political debate uh, in Congress among the parties? What, what's your take on this? And is this trumping the economic reasoning? Is this the political things saying, okay, in two years time, we would like to keep the majority uh, in uh, the Democrats would like to keep the majority in the Senate and the House. Okay, let me come to that in a second. I want to talk just about uh, uh, two substantive economic issues. Um, first is, yes, if we're over, actually, let me, three, three issues uh, amongst the economic issues. Um, the, uh, the, um, first of all, the, the, it's not just the specific, I mean, it, the, the, uh, Shots in arms is is what Larry talked about, and that's a that's a big slug of stuff. But also the uh, there's a quite a lot of spending on other things, notably education, basically virus proofing schools, and that's a that that's very much actually that is a form of long term investment because getting kids back to in person learning as soon as possible is is, a, is an investment thing, uh, very probably more important than any kind of infrastructure. Um, but still, um, there is probably a quite a lot of air in this stuff that is not. Uh, is not really well targeted on people in need. On the other hand, trying too hard to make stuff well targeted, we, we're not able to make a very precise cut there. So a certain amount of, of stuff that is, is kind of scattered, maybe uh, 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 scattershot uh, with only some of it falling on the people who, who are most in need is, is okay. Um, the, now the question there then becomes, well, but isn't that setting up for excess demand the next few years. Uh, for what it's worth, I think of that as just a wealth, an increase in household wealth, and the marginal propensity to spend out of wealth is not 0.5, it's something like 0.1 or less. So it's, it's something that's gonna be spread over an extended period. It's not, it's not a 2022 issue, it's a, it's a next, next decade issue. Uh, it's, I know it's, it's liquid, but it's still, uh, and, and of course, there, you know, GameStop, yeah, people spending their stimmies, there's always going to be some of that. Um, the, about the Fed, um, my read, I, when I try to come up with something that looks comparable in scale to what I think the actual fiscal stimulus is going to be, I actually come up with the Reagan um, tax cuts and military buildup of the early 80s. And of course, what's hard there is that you had layered on top of that was the Volcker recession. So a very tight monetary policy, which was instituted before the tax cuts led to a severe recession and then was relaxed and you had mourning in America. But if you actually ask what happened after that, which was a situation where tight monetary policy was in effect trying to offset fiscal stimulus, it actually worked. We had a basically a soft landing in 84, 85 and nothing terrible happened. Now you can go through it, but that, that did not, that the experience of the eighties, which is the most dramatic tight money thing that we see, but the tight, the, the, the story about tight money causing a recession is one that's before the fiscal stimulus. It's, and they, I, my read on that is that the Fed actually managed to handle the fiscal stimulus pretty well. Um, Marcus, politics. Of course, that hangs over everything. In fact, the reason why at some level, Larry and I are having a purely academic debate. This, this thing is going to pass and it's going to pass at, with a number very close to 1.9 trillion. Um, and it's going to uh, pass that way. And it's going to include a bunch of checks that are where the economic case is a bit weak. And the reason is because um, the checks are enormously popular. Democrats were badly, badly burned 
by the experience of the Obama years where an underpowered stimulus helped to lead to a Republican takeover of Congress. Um, it's political stuff is just incredibly fraught. I mean, we're kind of mostly, I hope, in an insurrection-free zone here, but when you take a look at who the other party is um, and the urgency of doing stuff that is popular, especially when you've kind of promised it. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the Democrats hold the Senate in large part because their two candidates in Georgia promised people $2,000 checks. Wisely or not, as you know, the fact is the party is not going to go back on that. So um, yeah, the politics overhangs it. Now, I don't like that. I want to be a technocrat and not be thinking about what's, what's going to uh, uh, move. But, you know, this is, this is uh, you know, it's, I feel like a classic uh, villain here. You know, this is real life. You know, you can't handle the truth. The fact of the matter is we, the economic policy has to be contingent on, on the fraught political situation. Thanks, Paul. Let me pick up on the 1980s. Of course, the 1980s, we had a high nominal interest rate. And I was just wondering whether, Larry, you could outline a little bit, and Paul can come back to this as well, what are the implications of hiking the interest rates? Uh, will there be a soft landing, as Paul said? But I'm worried in the sense that, you know, if you look at the 30-year mortgage rate, it's roughly 2.7%, um, inflation 2%. So it's really, you know, half a percentage point of a real interest rate on mortgages for 30 years. And there would be, you know, if the rate were to go up, the real rate goes up, uh, what happens then to all the asset prices? There will be a huge uh, reallocation on the financial markets. And what happens to the emerging market economies? Now, what happens if the US were forced to rise interest rates to some extent? What are the repercussions for the rest of the world? Perhaps if you can elaborate on that, on the implications of the exchange rate and the emerging economies in particular. Let me just uh, say that I think uh, Paul makes a case that there can be some air. Uh, I think it's hard to get the conclusion that you're not talking about a trillion dollars of air. And that trillion dollars that Paul recognizes is kind of of air is uh, the largest fiscal stimulus we've ever had uh, in the United States. And so expressing concern about its possible consequences seems to me to be the right thing to do. Um, I was careful in writing my piece to refer to say that it was hugely important that we have a major fiscal stimulus program right now, that the egalitarian character of the Biden program was uh, very positive, but that it came with risks uh, that had to be uh, managed. I think the risks associated with, and I can't say for sure that it may be that everything will materialize uh, smoothly. But if you ask me about the risk that uh, the economy will start to inflate, that it will be explained in terms of specific uh, factors, that bubbles will emerge greater in financial markets, and that a Fed behind the curve will then lurch in a way that causes a recession and that has substantial adverse global consequences. If you ask me about the risk that we will just be inactive for a long time and discover ourselves in a new norm with much higher and rising inflation uh, expectations and that the flat Phillips curve that is now a cause of such celebration will become a major problem in terms of the difficulty of uh, restoring uh, stability. If you ask about the risk that a growing expectation that real interest rates are going to be low or negative forever drives extreme uh, risk taking that creates uh, bubbles that then generate momentum that lead to substantial uh, downturns and a, a structural break. If you add up all of those risks, and if you add up the way in which the, what I suspect will be the growing salience of those risks over time may inhibit 
spending on necessary uh, public investment, it seems to me to be a much better course to lock in the public investment uh, now uh, rather than to lock in the spending power for uh, households. On one technical point, I, I'm surprised by what uh, Paul said. I would have thought that it was certainly to be expected that if you gave middle-class families $2,000, $6,000 of the family of three checks, which they didn't spend this year in part because of COVID, I would have thought the best guess would be that the spending propensity out of them would be far greater than the spending propensity economists usually estimate from wealth, which is driven by fluctuations in the stock market. So I think the excessive, to the extent there are buildups of assets because of saving this year, the right assumption about the rate at which they'll be spent in 2023, 2022, 2023, 2024 is much greater than would come from normal estimates of the propensity to consume out of wealth. So I'd rather be locking in the public investment and the climate change than uh, locking in uh, the rest. And I don't think it's that hard actually to target pretty totally those only $20 billion lost wage and salary income. And I don't know what the argument is that you need to spend five or six times that in order to make sure you're reaching the people um, who uh, need uh, to be reached. And since even on Paul's calculations, that's such a large part of uh, the program. I think that's a case that needs to be more fully articulated. And look, if this is a necessary political compromise, it's a necessary political compromise, but I think it's our job as economists to say that there isn't really a compelling economic uh, case for it, that it carries with it risks that need to be managed and then uh, we're a democracy. And if our political leaders think it's necessary to reach a political compromise, that's a decision we should respect having warned about the risks. But I don't think it's right for us to tilt our economic analyses um, in favor of what is a politically expedient conclusion. Thanks, Larry. So let me on among these risks, of course, I'm very interested in bubbles all the time. So I would like to know from Paul, do you think if bubbles emerge and there's a huge wealth generation from bubbles, people don't spend on it, but what happens if bubbles burst? What happens then? Uh, what uh, will be the outfall from then? And then I would like to go a little bit to uh, the role of expectations and the inflation anchor. So do you see any threat of the inflation anchor breaking at some point? Or do you think that's we're far away from this because it's now so ingrained in people's beliefs uh, that inflations will stay around 2%? Oh, so let's, first of all, on bubbles. Um, bubbles happen. Uh, trying to use macroeconomic policy, trying to condition your macroeconomic policy on fear of bubbles is very, very problematic. You have to be much more confident that you have a bubble than we usually are. There are occasions when you, when a bubble seems to be as clear as, as anything, housing bubble in, in, in 2005, six, I, that, but that was more the exception than the rule. And I will just say on, on the whole, uh, Interest, interest rates, which Marcus seems to be concerning you. I don't think that's, I'm hearing this from Larry, but the, uh, the, the concern that, that, that low interest rates are, uh, are basically a bond bubble and that, that, uh, that tight monetary policy to offset fiscal stimulus will, will burst it. Uh, it could be, but uh, I would have said, I mean, I, there's this uh, hypothesis called secular stagnation, which somebody or other has done a lot to popularize, uh, which leads me to believe that there are actually pretty good structural reasons for interest rates to be low and that to believe that they will 
even if there is an interest rate spike in the wake of the American Rescue Plan, that, that it will subside and it will be back in a low interest rate world. Right? I think that we are, I, I'm still persuaded, not 100% because 100% certainty just doesn't come with the territory, that, um, that we are still basically in a world of excess savings looking for some place to go and, uh, and, and that, that we're back there. Um, I, I mean, I, it, it's funny, if in a way, the closest parallel to the financial risk that I think is what Larry is saying and maybe what you're saying, Marcus, as well, is, is something like a 1994 when the Fed tightened and there was this bond route and there was a spike in, in interest rates. And uh, uh, we're certainly at the Fed, they worry about, you know, they, that precedent is very much on their minds. Um, but funny thing is, it didn't actually lead to a recession. In fact, you still, the, the US economy was still busy adding 300,000 jobs a month right through all of that. And so I, I'm not convinced that that's a big concern. There's just, I, there's, we're getting so many things here. I mean, I, I, I would agree with that the, the Marshall propensity to spend out of, I think we're stuck calling them stimulus checks, even though they're not stimulus and they're not checks, but the, the Marshall propensity to spend out of stimulus checks is going to be higher than the Marshall propensity to, to, to spend out of stock market fluctuations, no question. Uh, but, and maybe higher than the Marshall propensity to spend out of housing wealth, which is higher, but not, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it's, uh, but there, there's reasons to think it's not that large. And um, look, if, if I had thought, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I'm being, allowing political, trying not to, to claim that things are good when I don't think they're good, but I, I am allowing political reality to, to constrain the things that I'm advocating. Uh, a, a big infrastructure, a build back better, slug in this first package was not going to happen. The only way it's going to happen is if there's a lot of credibility built around the first package. And uh, um, now it's possible that people a year from now will be saying, oh God, look, look, they, they overheated the economy. It was too big and no more money for Biden. Uh, but what I think is more likely is people will say, hey, I got my check, uh, the economy is booming, these people seem to know what they're doing. And, but in any case, the, the, the economic constraints, the, the financial, the debt is not a constraint. Uh, in fact, aggregate demand is not going to be that much of a constraint. So it's all really about the political economy, like it or not, I don't want to play politics either, but like it or not, political economy is what's going to determine how much of an investment agenda we can have. So. Paul's, much more, Paul's much more confident that aggregate demand um, and concerns about financial stability are not going to be an important issue um, by the end of the year, given a program of this magnitude, uh, than I am. He might he might be right, but he's much more he's much more confident of that than I am. I kind of agree with him if. If you had asked me to make the case that I was wrong, I would have made the same, I would have used the same example he did of 1994, um, where you did have a big interest rate uh, set of spike, a big interest rate uh, spike, and you didn't have adverse economic uh, consequences. I think the big difference between that environment and this one is that in 1994, we had a government that was organized around the theme of fiscal stability, deficit uh, reduction, and bringing down the debt share of GDP. And a similar kind of scenario in an environment of double digit budget deficits, it seems to me we carry with it uh, substantially more risks uh, than what we had in 1994. There may be, an, there may be a difference between um, Paul and I um, in the extent to which one wants to make uh, the best be uh, the, uh, the enemy of uh, the good. I think in terms of economic analysis, the way we can make the biggest contributions 
is by warning about um, what the risks are and um, by being clear about what would be the best opportunities. And it doesn't sound to me like Paul disagrees with me that if we did what was necessary to fight COVID, to remove, to remove schools and to get schools going, and then we did what was necessary to meet that $20 billion a month in lost wage and salary income. And beyond that, we focused heavily on public investment, um, that that would be a better approach to meeting the needs of the moment. I think where we differ is that he's more optimistic than I am that on the path we're following, we'll get to more or less the same place with some non-optimal policy and some groundwork laid that will make the public investment more likely. He's more optimistic that this will prove to have been a very successful political route to getting to that uh, than I am. But on the fundamental economic analysis, I think what I've found encouraging is that we have fairly similar views. Thanks. So let me just move a little bit also to uh, monetary policy as well. And Paul perhaps can elaborate on that. So you both argued actually that the central bank independence is not so important anymore. But this was under a time where we had fiscal constraint, fiscal austerity in many, many countries in the world. Would you still think to manage the risk which might come along with the stimulus? Do you think now central bank independence is more important again? So that there's, because you have now, of course, I agree that you, you have a high debt burden at that level, but with a low interest rate, the debt burden is not so high. So how do you see this? On the one hand, the debt burden for the government is not so high because the interest rate is so low, and there might be also less room for the central bank to move or more political pressure. How important is central bank independence these days? Uh, did it become more important now with this debate or do you think it's still not so important? Okay, um, actually, I just wanna make one more point which I forgot to make earlier, I didn't, uh, um, which is that in this program, there is a, a fairly large role, partially implicit of automatic stabilizers. That if the economy does really well, First of all, the unemployment outlays, the unemployment insurance outlays will come down uh, so that the, that component will be substantially smaller than, than is now being projected. And also, uh, although this is, this is the implicit part, uh, if, uh, if the state and local fiscal situation is substantially better than we expect, I don't think, I think that they will basically, they will bank a large part of the aid so that they're the it the downside if the economy has an upside then that in in fact is going to probably reduce the amount of stimulus that's going to be supplied so i think that's worth saying about yeah central bank i don't i think it's um there was a reason why central bank independence became a a, a kind of a, a, a talisman uh which was that we had a period of of at least where it was perceived that that uh, that um, that inflationary psychology and, and, and political dominance over central banks led to bad stuff. And uh, you, can, you can certainly see that to some extent in, in you know, Arthur Burns, and you can see that the, the dash for growth in Britain and all of that stuff. Um, and so we got to this uh, position of central bank independence being crucial. And then, but it, that was actually a response to an inflationary environment of, of that's long gone. Now, there is a question. If, if we're saying, okay, actually a lot of bad stuff happened as a result of central bank independence, it would be kind of a shame if we ditched it exactly as we approached the moment where actually the case for central bank independence is coming back. It would be, you know, it, we would be managing always to be fighting the last war economically. I, I don't, I think we're quite a ways from that. You know, the thing is that it took years. You, you don't unhinge expectations that quickly. It's not the case. It's not. It's simply. In fact, it, it, yeah. It's it's not the case that the moment that LBJ decided to have both guns and butter, that 
inflation expectations very well. There was years and years of, of, of bad uh, policy judgment. And um, I don't really have any worry that the current US administration is going to try to bully the Federal Reserve into accommodating its fiscal policies. Um, and uh, uh, who knows, you know, what may follow, but God knows if, if we have, uh, if we, you know, if we have a, another administration like the one that just left, uh, uh, I think central bank independence is gonna be the least of our concerns and it wouldn't persist anyway. So uh, I, I just don't think that that's such a, it, I, I think that's an issue that you know, we microeconomists tend to make a big deal, tend to regard, particularly because we, you know, particularly macroeconomists of a certain age, where it's, you know, Larry and me are, we remember the, the, the 70s, but the, uh, but the, um, but I don't think we should be all that obsessed about the, the question of central bank independence, not yet. I'm much more, I, if there are concerns, they are the ones Larry is raising, which is that this is a really big fiscal package and, and not, not to worry that Jay Powell is going to try and make it disappear or inflate it away. Thanks. So let me throw this question also to Larry, but also combine it with uh, an earlier theme Charles Goodhart put out in this webinar series. And he also wrote a book on, he argues that, you know, the low inflation, low in real interest rate era is over, which relates, is very contradictory to Larry's uh, secular stagnation. Um, but he argues one reason inflation was so low was essentially that there was a huge labor force in China and Eastern Europe joining the global workforce. And that brought you know, inflation rates down. It really put pressure on the trade unions and, and others. So the wage bargaining changed. And he argues, at least Charles Goodhart argues, this pressure will go away. And uh, hence, the low inflation era will not persist. Do you share these concerns at all? I think that's a, probably a much more long run perspective. Uh, your worries right now are, I guess, much more short run uh, con concerns. Look, uh, my, I'm kind of under, under sort of the influence of a couple of things. Um, when I was in graduate school and my early years uh, as, a, as a professor, the liquidity trap and zero interest rates was kind of an interesting historical thing that didn't seem terribly relevant to today's, uh, to, to the world of today. And then it became central. And I learned from that, that things have a way of coming back. And so I think there's a current generation of economists that finds after 40 years of basically low state, low inflation, where the inflation rate basically hasn't changed importantly in a generation and a half, follows that any right-hand side variable is going to have a zero coefficient predicting a dependent variable that doesn't move. And so what kind of inflation is kind of off the radar screen. And I think that's probably a uh, mistake. And on top of that, you have a kind of psychological uh, phenomenon. I kind of lived through the Japanese bubble of the late 80s and there were a lot of people who were confident that Nikkei was overvalued at 25,000. There were even more people who were confident that it was overvalued at 30,000. And by the time it had gotten to 35,000, there were a lot of people with humility who weren't confident of anything. And so I think the fact that predictions of inflation have been wrong uh, for uh, a very long time, obviously, is a probative fact on the one hand, but it's a fact that can be too probative. So I think the concerns about inflation accelerating, the concerns about expectations, which we don't understand very well, becoming unanchored, the concerns about what could happen uh, to uh, the dollar, I think in environments which you don't understand very well, it's a good idea to take small, careful steps unless there's a compelling reason to do something else. And so when I look at an 18% of GDP deficit in a year when unemployment is predicted to be kind of like it was in 2015, 
I kind of think I'd rather see the energy pushed forward over uh, the longer term into things that I know will do good uh, in terms of uh, public uh, investment. And that just seems to me like the better approach. I think Paul and I agree and uh, probably disagree with uh, Charles Goodhart um, in thinking that the right best guess considering all the forces is that the idea that savings absorption is our principal macro uh, problem is likely to be right as a way of thinking about the next decade. And it's just a question of if you have that, how much should you be putting into place a program for the next decade to address that? And how much should you be doing all of this uh, right now? It's like the question I think I referred to earlier of if you believe in an increase in the minimum wage, how should you feel if somebody wants to increase it to $22 for the next two years? You kind of like the idea that they're on your idea about increasing the minimum wage, but maybe this isn't the best way uh, to, uh, to do it. And that's where I come on, uh, the, judgment, on the judgments now. Yeah, can I just um, uh, say, say, I mean, I mean, Larry and I are actually in many ways in similar uh, wavelengths. And um, the, definitely, that just because something has been true for a long time doesn't mean it will always be true and things do come around. And, uh, um, but it's also true that um, in some ways, if we're worried about an unhinging of expectations here, this is an extremely, the, the, the sweet generous nature of what's going on is some insulation against that. Seeing us run huge deficits in the face of a unprecedented pandemic is something that I do believe even that people, wage and price setters, financial markets and so on will largely treat as being a one-time event. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's it, the, the idea that we're going to, it's going to suddenly be 1978 in people's minds again um, is that's, that's too far. If we continue to run, you know, if we continue to do massive uh, diffusely targeted uh, programs after the pandemic is over, well, then that would change. But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and just a word about the good heart point. I just, um, the worrying that this is, this is stuff I'm actually supposed to know something about. And it, that sort of thing drives me a bit crazy. Um, the fact of the matter is 70 to 75% of the workforce is in non-tradables. Um, that, uh, that the idea that, that wages are depressed in, uh, that, that we are unable to have labor organizing uh, because of Chinese competition in our vast service sector really doesn't make sense. If you try to ask me, why is it that major, why, why did Walmart not get unionized when it took over from General Motors as the biggest employer? That wasn't because of globalization. Uh, you can't drive to a Chinese big box store. It was because of, uh, essentially because of politics, because the the, serv the giant service sector companies got giant largely during the Reagan years and where, where both legal and illegal tactics to block union organizing were, were essentially given complete freedom of action. So, uh, so no, I, I don't, it, it's possible that the, that the low inflation environment of this, these past you know, three decades is, is behind us now. Uh, but not for the reasons that Goodhart is, is saying. And, and mostly I think not, because basically I come back to it. I was uh, vastly persuaded by, by Larry's secular stagnation uh, argument. I, I think that we have a, a, a lot of persistent economic weakness you know, beyond this, beyond the, the, the COVID relief into, into the, into the post-COVID world. Um, it's going to be, a, a, we're, we're going to be back in, in the world we were, which is when we're creating enough demand and avoiding uh, slowflation is going to continue to be the big problem. Look, maybe a summary, maybe a summary of some part of this, Marcus, is I think in some ways, um, Paul and I are in very substantial agreement. 
I think Paul and I both believe in two propositions. One, we should have a effective response, maximally effective to winning the war against COVID and protecting its victims. That it's likely that that will have been accomplished within a year. And that beyond that, we need a large scale effective program against uh, secular stagnation. I think Paul is more confident than I am, though we're equally hopeful that the current program will be the first step down that road and is the best way to move us down that road. And I am more concerned that the current program, because of its various overhangs, will become the defining program of this era and leave us less responsive to the overall uh, secular uh, stagnation uh, challenge. But I think that our disagreement on that point should not um, obscure our agreement on a fundamental point where we are at still at considerable variance with many in the economics profession and even more in the financial establishment that our fundamental issue of our time is um, the absorption of saving. And it is that rather than the rise of Chinese labor or um, some kind of uh, promiscuous profligacy on the part of central banks that is the way to understand uh, the major economic trends uh, that are playing out. Thanks, Larry. So, Paul, I give you another minute to respond, and then no. I will conclude. Uh... I think that's exactly. Uh, I mean, the truth is, we'll find out. I, I think. I think, Larry, is. I think you're exaggerating. I think you're wrong. I'm not exaggerating. I think. I think you're. You're excessively worried about the risks, but I'm not sure of that. I, I'll admit that I'm not sure about that. And, um, but at it, a, it, it, it's a peculiar thing because although this debate only started very recently, uh, it's already pretty much moot. In fact, something that is, you know, it, it's, it now seems unlikely that it will be as small as 1.7 trillion. It's actually, this, this thing is going to pass, it's going to pass with Kamala Harris's vote. And it's, uh, um, and, um, and then we'll find out uh, and hope that it can be managed. And then you're right. I mean, I say actually the overriding issue is of course climate change. Uh, but the uh, but the way to deal with that and simultaneously deal with the problem of secular stagnation is through a lot of public investments. So this behind us, that's where we should be going, and we'll see whether whether the this this massive thing it is massive whether this massive thing paves the way for that or gets in the way of it. And uh, cross your fingers and hope that hope that the optimistic view is is right. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you, both of you, and I think the audience really appreciate it as well. Let me just summarize, perhaps there's a lot of agreement, so we always uh, stop with a positive note. So both of you agree a lot. There's a different emphasis in some dimensions. I, I see that Paul is seeing more the political constraints, Larry is seeing more the risk dimensions, uh, but you know, at the baseline, there's a big agreement. And with this, thanks again, fantastic and uh, great appreciation for the both of you. Bye-bye, Paul and Larry.